Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come in, have a seat, get comfy. It's just next to the sliding library ladder, and right below the shelf titled Childhood Favourites. Pick a book, your favourite book. That's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a really towering to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am your bisexual coded spinster aunt who screams into the wind at five in the morning. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I'm a possibly drunk and sulky. We've been friends for ten years and are always swapping books. But despite having the same taste in books, we never get round to reading each other's recommendations. It's always just another book on the pile. It's a seriously big pile now. It might crush me in my sleep. So each month we're going to force each other to read a book. The new reader will give a blind summary of the book, we'll both go away and read it, and then we'll return to chat about it. So this week, let's get to talking about Secret of the Sirens by Julia Golding. Morgan, tell us all about Secret of the Sirens. When did you discover it? How did you find out about it? Do you remember? <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, I do not remember. Because <laughs> Secret of the Sirens was published in 2006, so I was a teeny tiny six-year-old. My copy is very yellow, with age. So it's about 15 years old, which is a horrifying sentence that I'm able to say. And the spine is completely broken. I had to buy a new copy. But I think I was probably given the first one or two by my mum. I definitely got the third one, Minds of the Minotaur, when it was new, because I have a signed copy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, because it turned out that one of my mum's work friends, grandparents, was neighbours with Julia Golding. Oh my god. I think <laughs> it was a while ago. I was definitely into it when it was first coming out. So Secret of the Sirens is about a girl named Connie who can talk to all forms of animals, but she doesn't know that yet. And it's about a secret society that protects mythical creatures. And it's also about shapeshifters and seagulls and dragons and mythology. You know, six-year-old me was already a mythology nerd. It's interesting, is this cause or effect? Did you love this book because of mythology or are you a classicist now? because of this book. This is a great question. These 10 year olds are out here reading the Odyssey. I could never. I've been trying to force Soren to read these books for like 10 years now. You've done it. The author, Julia Golding, has done a lot of really wacky stuff in her life. She worked for the Foreign Office for a few years in Poland. She worked for Oxfam for a while as a lobbyist, campaigning at the United Nations to lessen the impact of war on civilians living in war zones. Published over 50 books in various genres. I'm sorry? 50? 50. Jesus Christ. Okay, what did I say about this book two weeks ago? Shall we listen? So of all the books that we've done for The Hidden Bookcase, I feel like I know the least about Secret of the Sirens, which I feel a bit bad about because I'm sure Morgan has told me about it, and I apologise and I beg forgiveness. But Secret of the Sirens, the tagline on it is mythical creatures live among us all, we must protect them. So I'm wondering if it kind of has an environmentalism bent? somehow, kind of like conservation, but for mythical creatures. But beyond that, I'm pretty lost. I'm assuming that there's a Greek mythology through line, partly just because it's Morgan, um, but sirens obviously do appear in Greek mythology, and I know that one of the later books has minotaurs in the title, uh, and also just the art style on this cover. There's a figure that looks a little bit like a Greek vase pottery figure, his helmet seems a bit Greek. So, I'm excited to read it. I, I'm going in extremely blind and I'm trying to come up with like a fun, wild prediction, but I feel like I know way too little. Cute. I am genuinely a little embarrassed with how little I knew because I'm sure that you've told me, but it's just gone. <laughs> I mean, you got Greek mythology bent, which honestly I had not remembered that sirens were Greek mythology things, and you got environmental. It's not just Greek mythology, which I suspected could possibly be the case going in. Mm. This new cover, let's talk about the cover, because this does give such a Greek pottery vase vibe, which I'm obsessed. As soon as I found out about new covers, I had to go out and buy them. And it gives so much more about the book. Mm. You've got sirens, you've got compasses, you've got seagulls. Whereas the original doesn't even have a tagline, and it's just clip art waves and a compass with a winged bird, because that is the symbol of the... A winged the... bird? Yeah, a bird with wings, Soren. As opposed to a non-winged bird. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much more focused on the logo of the four mm. companies. Each of the books has a different company logo on the front in the original covers. I do love the art. I think it's very fantasy. It's very kind of Beast Quest. Yeah, it kind of gave me that impression as well. New covers, absolutely stunning. Old covers, very close to my heart, but tell me nothing. Let's talk fantasy map though. Yes, there's a map, I was so happy. Having been to Exmouth quite a lot recently, the vibes of Hescombe and Chartmouth were so vibey. The sea, this has reignited my love of the sea, which I have never had before because the sea scares me. So it's given me a love of the sea. <laughs> 
I love that this is what ignited your love of the sea, a book where several people are drowned, <laughs> forcibly. It's about the vibes, Soren. <laughs> it's about seaside town vibes. That is true. The idea that you could just walk down to the sea, so foreign to me. Whenever people talk about that, so envious, that sounds so great. I had a friend the other day who was like, the seaside scouts, they live 10 minutes away from the sea, they're so far away from the sea. And I turned, I'm sorry. You can still hear it, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you can smell it. Yeah, I had a minor breakdown. It's, it's the Londoner. The Thames is a compromise for me, it's fine. Mm -hmm. As long as I can be near water, it's fine. I can just go to the Thames. Mm. This is true. You've got to be able to do those walks by the water. Mm. Sometimes you just have to go stand by a large body of water and contemplate. Go stand by a large body of water and maybe then you'll calm down. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what we're talking about. The map. I always love opening a book and getting a map. And I feel that that has not changed since I was a child. I love the art style of this map. It's quite simplified and symbolic. Mm. The wind farm and the mines and the car stones and the bog... And even Devil's Tooth are book two and book three things. Malin's Wood is book two. Interesting. I kind of love that. Because you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what will be relevant. Although, actually, speaking of not knowing what will be relevant, the chapter titles in this book, sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> they kind of just tell you a thing before you get there. Yeah. Calervo. Yeah. I wonder if Calervo is going to turn up in this chapter. <laughs> and there was another one later as well. Kraken. Kraken, that was the one. That was worse, I think, to me, because, you know, it was kind of inevitable that Clever was going to come up at some point. We were in the final third. Mm. It was time for him to show up, analysing this as an adult with writer brain, but it's fine. Mm. But I wasn't expecting the Kraken to come back necessarily, actually. They kind of left it long enough for me to forget about it. Set it up earlier with Cole's father. Mm. But then the chapter title was like Kraken. And I was like, oh, I guess the Kraken is <laughs> going to be the solution to the entire climax. Surprise! But obviously, reading a children's book, I'm trying to get into that headspace. Speaking of it being a kid's series, can we talk about the writing style? I don't read that much 9 to 12 fiction anymore. I feel like as a bookseller, you did. I still read it. Yeah, there was so much darker stuff in here than I was expecting. The dog dies in this one. It's not even like he gets killed off screen or something. It's like, here's the villain. He snaps his neck and we're going to talk about blood. Like, brutally stamps him in the face. Also, there's a lot of people being drowned in the background. Mm. In some ways, this book was kind of black and white with morality. But then in mm. other ways, Connie is a bit of a murder apologist with the sirens. <laughs> they have killed several people and she's like, you just don't get it though. I think maybe this started off my love of morally ambiguous characters <laughs> because Connie throughout the series is like, I mean, Kalev is kind of right though. Like he's going about it the wrong way. But And that's one of the things I do love about this series is the further we get into the climate crisis, the more Kalev is kind of just correct. The nuanced thing of Kaleva being like, the world should burn, it's all humanity's fault. And Connie being like, yeah, that's kind of correct. But then Dr. Brock coming in and being like, but the people who are suffering from these attacks are the most impoverished. The people of the society who are not causing these problems in the first place. Which I thought was an especially interesting point. I read Climate Change is Racist by Jeremy Williams recently, which is a fantastic book. He criticised the way that climate change gets taught as this very depersonalised thing, in that we get shown melting icebergs, but there's very little discussion of the people who are being affected, the very real impact that climate change is having on impoverished people, particularly non-white people, mm. every single day. I really like the way it's actually approached from multiple sides. For a 9 to 12 book, this is a great introduction yeah. to sort of being eco, the climate crisis and stuff like that. Every single book deals with a different issue. Oil spillages, you've deforestation, whatever happens in the minds of the Minotaur, <laughs> to do with mining, I think. <laughs> It's been a while. It's a lot more about that than I remembered it being, mm. which I actually really enjoy. Although I was looking at book reviews on Amazon because I was bored and somebody was writing about the third one and was like, love this series, but it's getting a bit heavy handed with being like eco, just write a fantasy book. And I'm like, how have you got to the third book and not realised that that's the whole point? I feel like it's pretty on the nose from the start. Yeah. And also it's for kids. At the end of the day, it has to be a little bit heavy handed. Exactly. But I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't think it is. I mean, it is a subject. It's not, you know, a subtle metaphor. It's mm. a deliberately addressed subject, but I think that it's accessible, but also nuanced. Mm. For example, like having Jane, Connie's classmate, her father working at the oil company and then losing his job. Mm. It shows that side of the issue. But it's also very pro-union and anti-corporate, which I did appreciate. Mm. Yeah. The whole scene where the teacher's like, might get in trouble, but I'm going to support you. Criticise those people, even if we don't get the money for the new playground. Exactly. We love. This is just like a random aside, but when they introduce Cole with his wraparound sunglasses <laughs> at the peak of coolness and popularity, I... <laughs> that was 
aged interestingly because they've kind of come back in, but they kind of only cool if you're like Billie Eilish or something. I don't mm-hmm. think this like random twelve year old is necessarily getting away with it. Yeah, I imagine they just wanted to give him sunglasses so they wouldn't immediately reveal that he had heterochromia. Yeah, but. <laughs> I just found that funny because he walks in with the sunglasses and Connie immediately goes, this boy is way too cool for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing I didn't remember about these books is that they're not all from Connie's point of view. Yeah, that was interesting. Cole is basically a main character that shares the spotlight and I did not remember that at all. And I kind of love it. I liked Insights, but I kind of honestly wish that it had that traditional flipping between character points of view per chapter. Mm in that sometimes just being thrown into somebody else's head mid-conversation was a bit jarring to me. I don't know if that's just because of what I'm used to reading, and it could just be me reacting to something unfamiliar Mm. with fear. (laughs) Particularly before Connie knew about the society, she'd be going, why is Cole acting so strangely? And then the narrative would be saying, Cole is acting so strangely because he's thinking about the society and how he can't tell Connie. Mm. And that felt a bit unnecessary. There was a lot of that, where sometimes the narrative would just tell you something. Of course, kids aren't going to be able to pick up on every context clue, but it felt a little bit condescending to its audience at those times. And particularly when it was a character that we didn't need to be in the head of. At one point it happens when Connie's mother comes and visits. Mm. Connie's mother is sitting very uncomfortably at the table with Evelyn because she's ruining dinner. Mm. And then it explains that Connie's mother is thinking about the fact that the food's going to be terrible. That was heavily implied. We got it. (laughs) Evelyn can't cook. I liked it because it was different. That's fair. It sets up the possibility for insights that are important. It's not made obvious that they're important because you do have those teeny tiny characters who get a little bit of a point of view. And then you can mix in really important information. That's true. I think you can use it creatively. And I think sometimes when it was used with the villain, for example, Mm. it was effective. One of my only issues with the writing style is the fact that this was written before the Oxford comma was repopularized. Oh, I didn't even notice that. And maybe that's just me. There were so many sentences. I was like, this needs more commas, please. (laughs) I have a question, but I don't know if I'm jumping the gun by asking this question before we talk about characters, but I'm going to ask it. Morgan, yeah? what would your companion creature be? Ooh, that's a great question. Some sort of Greek mythology thing, because, you know, I am nothing if not consistent. A universal companion, but specifically for Greek mythology. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, no, I'd be a chimera companion, because I'm obsessed with the vibes of the one chimera companion we meet. And also, because the chimera is made of three different animals, it fits into all three companies. Because the animal chooses where it goes, and all three animals choose different companies to be in. And I am obsessed with that vibe, because I'm nothing if not unable to choose. And also the vibes, lion, snake, and goat. I used to be called a mountain goat when I was younger, because I could climb mountains better than my brothers could, so. There's something very gender about an animal that refuses to be one animal. Exactly, it's the non-binary energy. There we go. Everything comes back to the non-binary energy. You brought up the creatures choosing their own company, which was something I really liked. Mm. I was so confused to begin with, I was like, what is the taxonomy? (laughs) But as soon as they said that, I was like, okay, that's fine. That makes sense. I love that, actually. What would your companion animal be? Oh my god, I haven't actually thought about this, even though I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, selkies are right there, and they're so cool. That's so true. Although, Connie does briefly mention werewolves, but only because she's freaked out. She's imagining freaky animals. So I don't know if werewolves exist in this universe, but obviously if they do, then that's the answer. Objectively the correct answer. I mean, yes. <laughs> Let's talk characters. Saren, who is your favourite? Can I make a really rogue choice Mm. and say Skylark? (laughs) I mean, it's not incredibly rogue for you. (laughs) I was thinking about this earlier and I was like, why is it Skylark? Is it just the nostalgia of having grown up reading Linda Chapman novels? Mm. Because he doesn't actually get that much page time, but I just just liked him. I don't really register Skylark. (laughs) Because he's such a teeny tiny character. But piggybacking on that to talk about Cole. Mm. And the fact that it's the male main character who's the horse girl of the yes, series. Yes, I did love that, actually. I also wrote down Transmas Cole early on, just because <laughs> when he's in the group project with the girls, the teacher goes, girls, um, and Cole. <laughs> I've been there. Trans. Also, the, I'm going to put quotes around the word love interest, also having heterochromia, because heterochromia is a very much like a YA protagonist, female yeah. protagonist thing. And this being like, we both have heterochromia and we make a pair. I just thought it's so cute. It is cute. It was like a very sweet little thing for them to bond on initially. The fact that he has like a really funky name and weird eyes, those are the two things she used to get bullied about. And now she's like, oh, well, the popular guy has them here, so I'm fine. Exactly. I'm going to be okay. That was cute. I do love 
that's kind of like is your fave. I love the familiar psychic bond animal trope that I feel like comes up a lot in children's fiction and then just vanishes from adult fiction because I guess nobody wants to be telepathic with their cat, but I do. <laughs> what about you, Morgan? I'm going to cheat and have three, technically four. I love the Connie Calervo duo. That is very much kind of one-sided in this book, so I can't really talk about it too much. Ooh, okay. It's a lot more two-sided in the later books, which A, started off my love of morally grey characters and understanding between the villain and the hero. I think that Connie and Calervo's relationship is the epitome of that hero-villain dynamic. And then I have to say Dr. Brock rides a motorbike, rides a dragon, is an old dude. It's still very much the mentor character and the saviour. But then I also love Evelyn. Bisexual coded, screams at 5am, obsessed. She's a bit more tame in the later books. I thought you were going to say less tame. No. Oh. She gets a little romance though, and I do love the romance. It's... An interesting choice of romance. I mean, it makes sense. Rifling through other society members in my head, being like, who, who could it be? <laughs> the most controversial pick I can think of is the assessor that Connie hates. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Not him. <laughs> Actually, I got completely misled in that scene with him where he approaches Connie and is strange right before she gets kidnapped. I thought that that was the shapeshifter embodying mm. him. And then nah. it wasn't. The fact that, like, Connie just has to be like, oh, I guess he's fine then because no one will believe her. Yeah. You think you would believe the Universal who is in touch with the entire animal kingdom and mm. her power is basically vibes. And she's like, that guy has rancid vibes. And everyone's like, I don't care. <laughs> and the fact that neither him nor Shirley is, like, investigated for the fact that I know. the weather giant is evil. <laughs> She had a mental link with the weather giants. If the weather giant was on the villain's side, then presumably she knew about it and they just didn't. <laughs> exactly. Can we talk about the fact that the reason that universals can talk to all creatures is because they're companions to Calervo? Yes, that's really interesting. I am obsessed. It ties so nicely into the shapeshifter thing. Exactly. So I was team Calervo's a person actually who's learned how to shapeshift somehow, but then I was like, no, never mind. <laughs> Well, so he's actually from Finnish mythology, from the Finnish national epic about a character named Kalervo, whose entire tribe is massacred, and he's raised by another tribe, who it turns out are the ones who massacred his family. Then he accidentally seduces his sister, because he thought his sister was dead. Oh god. She kills herself when she finds out, and then Kalervo goes mad with rage, kills all the people who killed his entire family, destroying them with magic, and then kills himself. But then, at the end of the poem, the old sage warns all parents against treating their children too harshly. Sorry, is that the moral according to <laughs> according to this the moral is Kalevo was right and it's about cycles of abuse and he wouldn't have done this if you'd just been nice to him which i kind of love i was interested to see some incorporation of native american mythology as well mm. which i was a bit torn on and to be fair i'm not very knowledgeable on this so i don't feel like i can make sweeping statements on it i didn't get the impression that golding had actually decided on eagle child's specific heritage it seems like maybe she's fallen into that trap of painting all native americans with the same brush but at the same time for 2006 at least there was an acknowledgement that this is a native american myth yeah the acknowledgement of other mythologies outside of british was yeah. very good it's not just like magical creatures exist in the uk we don't need to worry about any other magic system of the four humans in the it's not called the council what's it called trustees two of them were people of color mm. and two of them were women pretty decent for 2006 small english town it would have been very easy to just be like well everybody's white but then connie's friends and it's a little bit more diverse that was fun yeah i can't really speak on anything because i am white but like for 2006 it felt like a very good attempt yeah well like more of an attempt than i would have read in other books especially for this age group yeah i was a bit like oh here's anina and she's cool and her family of course run the takeaway but <laughs> but i can see that this has been done in good faith mm. there was a time when it was harder to get sensitive with your readers and to research so i'm not mad about it personally one thing that i thought was kind of interesting mm. a lot of books from this era and i would say even percy jackson a little bit falls into this linking appearance to morality very heavily and I was interested mm. to notice that that didn't really come up here. The rock dwarves and the sirens are not exactly conventionally attractive but they're mm. not framed as evil for that and there isn't that mean-spirited thing of like oh this teacher is mean so she's also ugly. Mm. It just wasn't present. The only thing that I noticed it was only because I was looking out for it was Shirley's father who's briefly described as having a corpulent frame in a disparaging way. The context is that he's being compared unfavorably to Eagle Child but that was the only thing and I think that's quite unusual. Yeah. If you look at a lot of these books 
there's so much fat phobia and pushing of mm. conventional beauty standards and I was just refreshed by that. I think it does tie into the message of the novel and especially with Connie as the main narrator who is on the side of these other characters. She would never frame them in that way. Mm. There is a little bit of like the other characters being like, mm, sirens. Uh. Yeah. Whereas Connie's like, bird people, incredible vibes. 10 out of 10, no notes. I also, the fact that these characters are kids and like, yeah, occasionally they speak like 30 year olds, but they do have very realistic, their emotional range is sort of like a metronome. Yeah, I think of Cole's jealousy as he's annoyed because Connie's universal and then he realises how much danger she's in. But then they do still have that struggle to apologise. It's a very realistic way to deal with that sort of issue. Mm. It would make sense for that character to be jealous because he's been the golden child. You know, which is an interesting trope because I think usually it's gendered the other way. There is that thing of the girl that's been training for her whole life and then a guy mm. comes in and he's the chosen one. I'm specifically yeah. thinking of Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that is a fairly common trope. Yeah, like Percy Jackson. Percy Jackson does have it. It's interesting because it's subverted. I thought Cole's relationship with his dad felt very real. His dad was not cartoonishly neglectful or insanely immature, but he was immature in a very believable way. He isn't actively malicious, he just has different mm. priorities and doesn't register Cole in those priorities. And it's very interesting to see the different family structures. It's not just like everyone has their parents together or everybody only has one parent. Actually thinking about like the different dynamics and the different life situations. The supporting cast don't exist just to support the Golding. She's thought about who they are as people, what their private lives are like. Mm. They're not just there to conveniently give this bit of exposition or this line of dialogue. They are there to populate the world and that's how it feels. So, final thoughts? I enjoyed reading it and I think there's a lot of potential and setup here and I'm curious to see where it goes. I feel like I'm going to break your heart by giving it a three. Eh, that's okay. But I'm a mean person <laughs> to establish that I just rate low. So the rating is for a couple of times the narrative felt a bit awkward or the character voices seemed a bit stilted but generally this is a very solid piece of children's fiction. This is a series and it does feel kind of unfair to rate it just by the first book because it clearly is finding its feet here mm -hmm. and it has so many fun and interesting elements and I did enjoy reading it a lot. Morgan, what was your rating? It's been like 10 years at least since I last read this so it was really nice to sort of reread and be like this holds up. I rated it 5 out of 5 on Goodreads on nostalgia and vibes. I think I would rate it a 4 if I hadn't read it before, but I know what's coming later on. Yeah, so you can see the setup and you can see the foreshadowing. Book three and book four are firm five out of fives. Book one is more of a four. Book two I don't remember as well. And Morgan, do you have any recommendations for people that enjoyed Secret of the Sirens? I mean, Percy Jackson. I mean, I was going to say, if you've read this and you haven't read Percy Jackson, then quite frankly, what are you doing? Mm. Not what are you doing, because that's valid of you. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoy the Greek mythology elements of this and you haven't read yeah. Percy Jackson, you should obviously read Percy Jackson. Yeah. That's like Less what are you doing and more we know yeah. what you should be doing. Yeah, exactly. If you want something more along the sea fantasy vibe, The Mermaid, the Witch and the Sea by Maggie Takuda Hall mm -hmm. is basically about a gender fluid pirate witch and a sapphic heiress who is on the pirate ship but thinks it's not a pirate ship and is about to discover that she has been sold into slavery by her family. And it's also got mermaids and a really interesting magic system which is very environmentally based. If you want more of the environmental aspect, The Last Bear by Hannah Gold, which is illustrated by Levi Pinfold. This is a 9 to 12. It's very touching. It's about a girl living on a remote island with her father, who is a climate scientist, and she finds this polar bear that's been stranded from the Arctic. And she's trying to get him back home. It's a fun adventure. It's very wholesome. A similar feeling overall. I feel like I would be remiss not to mention, actually, also The Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. Oh, yeah. For younger readers, supposedly, and the companion animal psychic connection. For the second part of Nostalgia Childhood Favourite Month in December, I'm going to be making Morgan read the Shapeshifter series by Ali Sparks, the first book in the Shapeshifter series, not the whole Shapeshifter series, <laughs> Finding the Fox. But Morgan has to record a blind react, so I won't say anything more than I've already said over 10 years of the hostage situation <laughs> where I forced Morgan to listen to me about the Shapeshifter. So, until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to give the cat a scratch on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Briar discussing Secret of the Sirens by Julia Golding. You can find out more about the Companions Quartet at goldinggateway.com, and you can also find Golding at jgoldingauthor on Facebook. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, or send us a DM on social media, we'd love to hear from you. 
If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 19th of December, we'll be discussing Finding the Fox by Ali Sparks. As it's the last episode of the year, we also have a little surprise for you. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase.